sing, 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 sing. Everybody start to sing. La di da, ho ho ho. Now you're singing with a swing. Do 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 Welcome to the special edition of Italics, the third in our month-long series of special programming celebrating October as Italian Heritage and Culture Month. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. Each October, New York State celebrates Italian Heritage and Culture. What began as Italian Culture Week has grown into a month-long itinerary of numerous events spanning the city, state, and country, drawing in international participants and arguably having become the largest celebration of all things Italian outside Italy. On this edition of Italics, we'll talk with two iconic Italian-American actors, Antonio Bianco and Danny Aiello. Because you've never seen anything more obnoxious, and you'll never see it again. Let's go to the Calandria Institute and hear from Tonilo Bianco, who shares details of his craft and award-winning career that has spanned nearly four decades as well as some other things you may not have known. I actually started out as doing the theater. Okay. That was where I live, basically, and that's where I'm from, and I'm very proud of that because the theater is what makes an actor. Uh, the other stuff is uh, in the hands of the director mm -hmm. so, and the editor, and so they can make or break a performance. And, but on the stage, you're there, alone, doing what you have to do uh, from beginning to end with nobody saying cut. And uh, so that's where you're really tested. And not only, not only just that, but you have to project. And you have to project to the last row, mm -hmm. make sure everybody hears and sees what you're saying. And it's a tremendous amount of technique in terms of uh, and development and schooling that you really have to understand that it, just, it isn't just an actor talking. It's an actor uh, have rehearsed so many times. I love doing it over and over again because I'll finally maybe get it right. And uh, that's when people ask me, how come you, you like to do a play and you have to repeat the same stuff over uh, night after night? Don't you get bored? Never. I never get bored because I never get it the way exactly how I want it. And so I always get the opportunity to fix it. And that's what it's all about. A, a wonderful director said to me one time when I was in acting school, I, I go around and fix the hits. <laughs> and I believe in that. You fix yeah. the hits. You yeah. See. So you started in theater, then you moved to both the small and the big screen. Yeah. What about the difference between movies and TV? Well, usually in the movies you get more time <laughs> to do it again and again. And on television, uh, obviously, you, uh, you're, you're trying to do an hour show and, uh, and, and get to do a, f a, full, a full movie. Within and five days, you within have to do five, the hour show. Days, right. It's ridiculous. So it's much quicker and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you don't have really the, the time to develop a character so much, you know, and I love developing. The more difficult a character is uh, to play, th that's what attracts me. All the nuances and everything else that has to, you have to uh, acquire. I love portraying people uh, certainly that are not me, uh, and because no no writer has written me in a script yet, and so my job is always to or a novel. Or so my job is always to mold myself into that human being that the writer wrote about and, uh, and mold my, my different uh, habits and uh, uh, attitude and everything about that person who I picture. Is there any unique way to do that? There is no one way. Everybody, yeah. Every actor has its own method or way of doing it. And uh, I, I've been fortunate enough in my early days as an actor uh, to have gone to an acting school, a dramatic workshop, which no longer exists, uh, but uh, it's a school where Marlon went to and Rod Steiger and a few other people. Uh, and I studied there for two years, uh, became a, uh, the guy in the school, and they wanted me to go out to work, but I wasn't ready. I didn't think I was ready, even though I did all the shows. And so I went, because I was learning one way of acting, which mm -hmm. was the way that teacher was teaching me, which was basically from the outside in. He was more of a dance teacher, so he was teaching me what it looked like, and I learned a great deal of, of directing from him. So then I went to another acting school to learn from the inside out. And to, so I was able, able to put them both together and use them when necessary to whatever part or play that I am, that I am I'm going to perform in. And the odd thing is in the second, in the second school, uh, the Actors Repertory Theater, 
uh, I was there one year, and I was all of 21 years old, and the master of the school said to me, I want you to teach here. I said, teach? I said, I'm a student. I haven't, I haven't worked professionally yet. He said, I said, in order to be a teacher, you, you have to understand that these you know, young people coming in here to, to, and they're sensitive and so on. He says, see, you know that. That's why I want you to teach. So I taught there at the school oh. while I was studying, one year. Let's take a little bit closer to home okay. with regard to Italian Americans. You portrayed both the so-called negative and positive um, portrayal. You've had uh, roles of yes. Italian Americans. Sure. And uh, you and I, back in 2004, were at a big event at Seton Hall on yeah. the whole idea of anti-Italianism, et cetera. And yeah. there was a gentleman there who had um, who was very uh, rigid, let's say, with regard to Italian Americans playing certain roles, and said that he went on to say, use the term aiding and abetting of the defamation, et cetera. And mm -hmm. you came back, of course, what I thought was a most logical and practical answer. If you want us not to do those roles, come up with the shkarol, as you said, <laughs> which is the word that you used, and I thought was great. What kind of pushback have you had on some of the roles? that you've played, a French Connection, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been very fortunate. Why have I been very fortunate about that? Because I do more for Italian Americans than anybody I know. And, uh, and uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, that's a job, that's a character in a movie. And if you find, you'll see almost every character I portray has a reason for why he is doing what he does. And uh, uh, be it negative or, or positive in, in the character. And, and the, uh, uh, listen, I've done so much for Italian. I, I was the national spokesperson for the Sons of Italy for five years. So they thought enough of me of what I've done for charities and Italian charities to have me there as a spokesperson. I am now with NIAF. And I've been doing Fiorello LaGuardia, one of our American heroes, for, for since 1984. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I've changed it quite often. I didn't write it originally, Paul Shire wrote it, and as the years went on, but as a one-man show, I have a, a little bit to say. So I've changed a great deal about it and, and had a lot of, uh, you know, his books and books of research on the man, so you suggest what should be in the play. And uh, most of my suggestions were, were taken, and then when, when he passed on, or before he passed on, he, he said, Tony, you know more about this man than anybody, just take over, do whatever you want. And so I, I bought the play from his estate, and I own it, and, uh, and I've changed a great deal of it, and it's very, very relevant to what's happening today in our country. And that's why the show is so successful, and I've been doing it now, and it makes me very happy to do that. I'm doing it in Washington, D.C., for the Congress, the Senate, and, uh, and, the, and our beautiful wounded warriors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when I did it up there, one of the... One of the lines they reacted to, which made me very happy, was when Fiorello LaGuardia says, well, listen, if I don't live up to my campaign promises, I want you to throw me the hell out of office. And they applauded on yeah. that line, yeah. which I was loved that they did that, you know, uh, in Washington, D.C., of all places. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and actually, am I correct in saying that the play actually aired first on public television? Yes, and we right. won five Emmys for that. Yeah. Yes, we, yeah. Have, we did it in, 80, that's, that's why we did it in 84 at the Egg in, in, in Albany. Yeah. That's where we did it there. They, they filmed it and we won five Emmys with WNET. Yeah. And then from there? From you, then on we moved along, we did it and then we did it on Broadway. And the great thing about this is we did it on Broadway in 1989, okay? And then of all places, I did it in Russia in 89. I did it in Russia, and one would say, as I said, what do they know about Fiorello LaGuardia? Yeah. The answer is nothing. What they reacted to was the fact that he was a man of and for the people. Huh. And so the, recep the reception was unbelievable. I did it in English, and they translated. So they, they had, they had exactly. headphones. They had headphones. The yeah. audience of five of the hundred uh -huh. of them had headphones, and it was being translated as I was doing it. It was interesting because it was like I always had the little the delay for the laugh. So you had to get, you know, you have to, you know, yeah, have to work that yeah, in. Yeah. But the great thing about it was the American ambassador who saw the show said to me, you have done more for our country in these two hours than I have managed to do in two years because the message was so strong. Power of art. And, and I can tell you that the audience was unbelievable. Yeah. I had flowers. I could, I had, on arms, my arm was like, I had to go off stage 
to drop them off for them. And then they came up on stage and gave me gifts and kissed me and hugged me. It was a magnificent moment in my life. Great. You know, great. To, to be there. I mean, yeah. to have them have their freedom and to experience Fiorello LaGuardia's message of of and for the people is what it's all about, mm -hmm. you know. And that's what I'm all about. And it's through too. the Listen. power of art. Exactly. If Having written this this play, I'm I'm able to to say what I want to say through LaGuardia mm -hmm. to our audience. You know, and it's about sacrifice, it's about giving, it's about love of this country and love of our ancestors and what they did for us. As you mentioned before, you are very much involved in the Italian American community um, beyond what you do on the screen or mm -hmm. on the stage. Sure. And um, you, you've actually even made films in Italy. Oh, yes. Your Italianness. What does that mean to you when you're out there acting, number one? Number two, what's it like to go back to Italy to make a film? I've been to Italy 57 times right now. Uh, uh, most of them were, were, was visiting, uh, uh, do, going movies, mm -hmm. and also visiting a girlfriend. So <laughs> <There you laughs> that go. always helps. Uh, and I had <laughs> the honor of playing. doing a movie with Gina Lollobrigida, yeah. the magnificent Gina Lollobrigida, yeah. women uh, of Rome, L La, La Romana, Romana, women right. of Rome, yeah. And uh, uh, that, and also with Zeffirelli, with Jesus of Nazareth, uh, and I uh, also had the marvelous experience of playing Joseph in Jacob and Joseph in 1973 during the uh, uh, Yom Kippur War in, it, in, uh, in, in Israel. And that was a, a tremendous uh, experience, to say the least. Uh, I arrived the day the war broke out and convinced the crew and everybody to stay and, and film. While the war was going on, we were filming. You were filming. It's an amazing story, but wow. that's too long. You've done a number of Italian films. I've done 12, yeah. 12, 12 okay. Yeah. One I noticed, um, Il Cugino Americano, The American Cousin, which is about a judge who is in peril, the, mm -hmm. the, the organized crime, the mafia, wants to come. And it's interesting, that film was done in 1986, mm. and it was almost prescient to what happens in 92 to the two anti-mafia judges, judges, Borsellino yeah. and Falcone. That's right. And yeah, I played, the, I played Falcone, I played the judge. You played the uh, judge, yeah. 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 yeah, and Vincent Spano, my terrific friend, a wonderful actor, was co-star in that. Mm -hmm. and we right, have, we have great time. right, he's yeah. the young cousin who's supposed to betray yes, the, yes, uh, yes. the old cousin, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And well, I did another movie with yeah. Vincent, uh, City of Hope. Well, I wanted, to get, to, right, about, yeah. I wanted to get to that, because mm -hmm. let's, let me, let's, let's talk about a couple of your films, some of, some of my favorite Tony LoBianco Italian-American films in the sense that you're playing Italian-American. One, of course, is The City of Hope. We'll start with that and then we'll go backwards. But one is The City of Hope. I always found that to be a wonderful movie. I don't think it has gotten its just due within the community of critics because people haven't seen it as much as many people should have no. seen it. Yeah. And, and, and also among Italian-Americans because it's not, there's an organized crime element in it, sure. but. But it's about family. It's about father and son. Sure. It's about those relations, and it's about organ. Or it's about criminality within <coughs> municipalities. Yeah, as well. it, but you know uh, the character I played the father. And you guys were great. We, I loved you guys. Yeah. You were great. Vince, Vince yeah. was my son, and uh, I was not, in, uh, you know, a gangster in it at all. No, I was in a construction head. But uh, uh, I, you know, it, it's it's a it's a it's a John Sales film, so uh, it's a good movie, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, Angela Bassett, I believe, was in it too. Yes, and, and other, it was. It was a. All it's about city corruption, right? You know, all about the politics of corruption and so on, which is my favorite subject, politics and mm -hmm. corruption. To get rid of it, as it is was as it is was Laguardia's uh, 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 job to do, which he did. Which he did. He cleaned right. the city up. In his 12 years as mayor, he really cleaned. He kept it spanking clean. When he left, it all came back again. So City of Hope is something we've got to get back on the okay. radar screen. <laughs> All right, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, the other movie, of course, famous movie, and you have a significant role in that also, is The French Connection, just a classic in American classic. cinema. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's one of the best films ever made, actually, and I'm very proud to be, have been. It was my second film. Yeah, I thought it was going to go on forever. Career, huh? You know, uh, my first film was The Honeymoon Killers, which was a, a, a black and white film in 1969, I believe, uh, and it it was, it's a cult classic, it was, it's Truffaut's favorite film, it's a great movie, a uh, great actor, uh, great acting in it, uh, acting, it's a true story, uh, but the next movie was uh, French Connection, and uh, it won five Academy Awards, uh, Gene Hackman, and, uh, Billy Freakin, the director, and, and a few others, um, 
And uh, that was a, a fabulous experience and very creative. I mean, I enjoyed, I enjoyed working with them very much. Very good people, very good friends. And there's another movie um, within the theme of Italian Americans that I thought was um, also a movie that we need to resuscitate as far as, and that's Blood Brothers, mm. which is about family. That right? is my favorite. Yeah. That was one of my, one of my the favorite yeah. films. 1978, I, I think it was. Uh, was it? I don't yeah. even remember the years yeah. anymore. It was a, it's a powerful film, as you know. And, and you know, it's interesting, Blood Brothers, and it's such a tough film because it's construction workers right. and he's very rough with his boy, Richard Gere. Uh, and, uh, but when they showed it on television, they changed the name to A Father's Love. Okay. Another, so they understood yeah. character. Yes. And be as tough as hard as I was with my son and what I wanted him to do, you yeah. know, for his own security and so on and so forth. They understood that character and said, mm -hmm. Father's love. They named the movie. And it fits nicely within these roles with the movie we already mentioned, City of Hope, where there's the father-son. That's right, father-son. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But in this one, the, the son wants to become a teacher. He wants to go to college. He wants to work with kids. he's coming from a family too, yeah, yeah. of hard workers, you know, construction, construction workers. Yeah, and you yeah. got to work to... And, then, yeah. and you and get the union card to keep yeah. you security and right. all that. And the kid doesn't know what he wants to do, but then he finds he wants to work with kids in a hospital so on. So it, it's a, it's a, it's, it really jars him. Yeah. And he makes this deal with him saying, okay, you work about two weeks, two weeks with me and then, and then you can go do, do what you want to do. And, he does, and he, you know, he, you know, they go to the bars, and he, you know, you know, all this hard hat stuff, you know. Yeah. But now, uh, a few other movies that I'm just curious to get your reaction. The Engagement Ring is one charming film, yeah. very charming. Uh, Patricia Heaton mm -hmm. and Vincent Spano again, and um, Eleni Kazan. It's great, fun, mo wonderful movie. Very Italian theme, uh, charming movie. People who see that remember it very, very much so. It should be seen much, much more. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody who sees it, it always comes up to me and tells me, I saw that movie. What a, what a great movie. Yeah. Very charming. Very, yeah. nice, very nice. Well, hopefully, you know, with, of course, we've had Netflix and Blockbuster, which is no longer around, but they've been around for 20, 25 years that we mm -hmm. could rent VHSs and DVDs. Now, of course, online, hopefully uh, many more of these movies will be available yeah. because they'll be much more accessible online. So, um, but I want to get back to another Italian American you played. You played actually, you once played in the movie, not him, the lady you played, or no, first you played him, and later you played in the movie, but you didn't play him. Right. And that's Marciano. Rocky, Rocky Marciano, Marciano yeah. the undefeated heavyweight champ of the world, everybody that we could be fantastically proud yeah. of. And I, you know, the great story was when I was a kid, uh, when Marciano was just coming up and fighting Joe Lewis, who was the you know, the only champ I knew who was one of the great fighters of all time. Uh, and, but, uh, but unfortunately, he was like 36 or 38. And Marciano, this young Italian kid, was going to fight him. And uh, as a kid, I think I was 10 years old, 11 years old, something like that. And I bet against Marciano. I bet <laughs> on my $5 against the candy store owner. And here I am, years later, I'm playing The You're Rock playing in the, the rock. movie. <laughs> that was great. I, yeah. I trained. I became... I put the weight on. I put. I became his size. Uh, yeah, his his weight. Everything about him. His shoe was a half inch longer than mine. But uh, everything. The measurements were all. And I worked with the uh, Jose Torres, the heavy, light heavyweight champ of the world. Oh yeah. And we, we 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 trained and trained and trained and I enjoyed that tremendously. And then I I even choreographed the fights. In fact, in, I fought one day for 16 hours. Making the film. Making the oh, film. Okay. We did all the fighting in the one day. I did all my own fighting, and I, I trained, I worked with all the fighters, and I blocked all the fight. You know, in between rounds, even, yeah. because I would sit, I would sit in, the, in the evening and watch the footage of the fight and, and do it like a, uh, like a narrator. The left hand, and he comes over the center of the ring, and he knocks him out. So I had that in my head about how the fight went, and so I had styled it as well. And all the incredible, incredible 16 hours of constant fighting. Ridiculous. <laughs> and then you were in the remake almost 20 years later. 20 years later, uh, John, Favreau John Favreau played Rocky, and I yeah. played a, a, a Frankie Carbone, yeah. the gangster guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, that was fun, too. Now, weren't you an athlete when you were very uh, young? Yes, yes, yes. Right? Well, yeah, I'm still an athlete. Huh? No kidding. Yeah. I was golden, a, golden Gloves? I was in the I Golden correct? Gloves, yeah. yes. I was a boxer yeah. Yeah. in my early day. And then I also had a tryout with the Brooklyn Dodger rookies, a baseball. Oh, that uh, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. was... Uh, 
That was fabulous. Oh, I, I still. What position did you play? I, I pitch and I play, f in, the, in baseball, I played first base and pitched. And I still, listen, I had a team for 16 years here, softball team for 16 years. I was the captain and the pitcher of it. We won eight championships. I'm still playing softball as right? we speak. I, I, sh oh, I pitched a shutout just the other day for the Actors Fund. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm insane is what I am. And I'm going to be Good. better next year because finally I'm working out. There I don't go. usually work out. I'm working out and, uh, and I'm walking, you know, uh, I'm losing weight and I'm happy about there all that know. stuff. And, and I'm you're feeling great. Good. Thank you, thank you. Yes. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling just terrific. Good. What other films come, when you think of, boy, what have I done this up thus far? Oh, wow. Wouldn't it be great to do that film or to redo, you know, what, what do you think back and say, oh, that was great? Your <sighs> experience, not necessarily the film, but even your experience. You know, there was my experience, it was a movie I did called The Last uh, Tenant that mm -hmm. uh, George Robino wrote. Uh -huh. And I did it with Lee Strasberg as my father. Wow. The great acting that coach. Had to be great. Okay, and uh, to my regret, after the movie was done, funny, I was sitting with Frank Sinatra, not to drop a name, uh, <laughs> and we were had, having dinner together, and we had such a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I wanted to redo that movie with Frank playing my mm -hmm. father, and uh, and it, and I, I just couldn't get it out because the, the guy who was the, the the father had like Alzheimer's. And I didn't know how to approach Frank to say, you could want to <laughs> play a guy, yeah. you know. And uh, in fact, he said to me, he said to me, you and I got to work together. He said, he said, we can show them something they've never seen before. And uh, I was at the tip of my tongue to say to him, ah, I got this script, Frank, you know. But I never did say it, and we never did work and together. And you never worked together. So that's a regret yeah. that, I, that yeah. I have, big regret. But that's a movie I would like to have done over uh, again with, with Frank. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the film La Strada, that movie has everything in it. The whole sensitive, all the sensitivity, yeah. the spirituality, everything, everything that goes in that movie is, yeah. is, is, is what I care about. Yeah, well, Italian. And I want, I'm trying to do films mm -hmm. that mean something, that have, like LaGuardia, yeah. you know, that have a message, that are doing something for the, for the people. You know, I, I have to say, there is a section in the play that I do mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of his honor, uh, The Little Flower, it's now called The Little Flower, that at the end of the play, <clears throat> I say, my friends, we are a nation of immigrants. So what do we owe our ancestors for their sacrifice? Sacrifice of ourselves for others and our country. So look all around you. Look left and look right. Come on, come on, look left, look right, and see your fellow man with understanding, respect, kindness, and love, and know that you are completing the dream. And when you go home tonight, just think of one thing that I said, and if you believe in it, do it. Do something about it. Stand up. My friends, you gave me a job and I did it. I'm now asking you to carry on with patience and fortitude and years from now when I've long passed on, maybe someday someone will say, what this city needs is another LaGuardia. So you know, I can't think of a better way to end this interview. <laughs> I really don't. I think we can end it there. That's a wonderful message from both your alter ego as well as from you, Tony Lobianco. Thank, Thank you very much God for taking the time out. And Denis. God bless you. And Denis. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> Up next, actor and singer Danny Aiello visits the Calandra you know, Institute you know, and delights us with a song. You're gonna miss your tall, thin Danny some of these days. Welcome to Italics, Danny. Thank you, it's nice to be uh, here. I just want to go through a, a little bit of your resume here, 90 plus movies, um, three TV series, um, Della Ventura, Lady Blue, The Andros Targets. Um, of course, you have a number of CDs out and some of them have been very successful, and we'll mm -hmm. get to that in a little bit. And then one of my favorite performances is in a music video. 
Papa Dupree. Oh, God. <laughs> still living that one down, Anthony. No, I don't want to do it. I'm a serious actor. I don't do videos. Are you serious? <laughs> My daughter Stacy was ten years yeah. old at the time. And, yeah. Uh, I went home and I said, they offered me uh, Sean Penn because he yeah. was a friend of mine and of course he was with Madonna. Yeah. So he said, would you play a father? I said, Sean, I don't do videos, ridiculous. Who's Madonna? True, I didn't have any idea. I'm sitting with Stacy and I say, Stacy, they, you know, I was sitting with these people, it's a musical artist, they asked me to do a video with. What's her name, Dad? Madonna, she almost faints. Dad, are you kidding? So what I had to do because of my daughter was to do it. I yeah. agreed to do it and I said yeah. I'll do it for four hundred and fifty dollars and I'll give you back the money because I did not want to lose my professional <laughs> stance as, an, as yeah. a serious yeah. actor. Yeah. And what happened was I asked them to guarantee Stacy would be able to take pictures with Madonna yeah. on the set. So they said yes of course. I brought Stacy down and Stacy didn't realize how some artists are. You cannot approach them when they're working. Me it's different because I'm like ham and eggs. but. Madonna did not allow anyone to take pictures. So from that point on, my daughter Stacy hated her. <laughs> she grew to love her again, musically, yeah. but not necessarily yeah. personally. It was one well, of the down points of my life. Well, you. That, and you know, um, and, and, and you, you know, this is your life. I mean, it's been your life for a number of decades, right? The, the, the entertainment industry, right? All facets of it. And there are those who are less approachable than others. And, and yeah, it's, it's too bad because within our own community of Italian Americans, sometimes it seems they lost uh, their their origins. You know. You know, I like to feel, Anthony, that I'm still the same person I was. Yeah. And things have changed. I met different people. Sure. I probably educated myself a little bit more, not through schooling, because I was a guy who went in one door in high school and out the other. So I truly had no formal education, but I learned growing up, meeting different people. So quite naturally. You know, friends would come over to me uh, and not really ask me, but they would ask people around, has he changed? And they w said, uh, well, somewhat, but you know what I figured over the years, it's not me who changed. It's them who changed toward mm. me because they felt, they see me now on the screen, that they have to approach me in an entirely different way. That has never been the case with me. Uh, you know, people that I've known for a number of years will tell you, I am truly the same guy. My feelings emotionally and every other aspect of my life is the same with the exception of I make a lot of money. <laughs> I make a tremendous amount of money. There you go. I get mo so much money it's embarrassing to accept And it. you do it doing it's far less now. And, and you do it doing something you love doing. I right? love it. I, love th right. I can't wait to get yeah. up in the morning because I know yeah. I'm going to get out and lie. You know? yeah. What do you do as an actor? You get in and lie. You play yeah. characters you wish you could have lived in life yeah. or, or maybe not live in life. But and instead our ancestors came over here and they worked there. And yes, the absolutely. Well, right. my, my mother and father were born in the United States, of course. I'm very proud of my Italian heritage. And, uh, but their parents, of course, came very poor, as many did at the turn of the century to here in New York City. And they grew into something very special. I mean, it, it's a wonderful country we now live in. To think a guy like me, I'm educated, four children, no job, and suddenly walk into a place and someone comes over and says to him, I love you to be in my play. I said, what am I going to do in your play? He said, well, act. I said, I can't act. I never acted in a day in my life except on the streets. You know, when I had to tell a police officer I wasn't doing that when he said <laughs> I saw you doing it. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah. it's, uh, it, it, it's amazing to know how far, if you're dedicated yeah. uh, and uh, truly want something bad enough, you, you can succeed. You started a little bit late in acting, 36 right? years old. Yeah. My first uh, stage play was actually 37. Uh, we're going on 37, and my mm. first movie was The Age of 40. Mm. And I've done almost 90 movies mm. from The Age of 40 till now, which is, I was totally unaware of that until recently. Mm. Uh, my, my associate, uh, Lou Baldwinari, tells me all the time, you've done 90 movies. I never had any idea how many movies I did. When you start to look back in retrospect and you see that the things that you have done in the business, your whole life begins to unfold before you. It's very difficult to believe that I had that much achievement in a business that I didn't think wanted me. I was an outsider from the beginning. I was an outsider from the end. I lost a lot of movies because of drugs, hmm. because I didn't do them. Interesting. That's strange, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I came up in the 70s when drugs yeah. were prevalent right. all over the business. Yeah. But I was one. I wasn't a preacher. I never preached to people, but I if anyone would offer it to me, I went out of my mind. So everyone knew, it's quite obviously, 100% of them, individually and collectively knew, do not ask Danny Aiello 
if he wants a drug. Mm. Of course, I used to get explosive, and people thought at the beginning, because I was basically a street kid, that I was a tough kid, that I would be trouble on the set, and I lost a lot of movies at the beginning because of that kind of reasoning. And when people are talking behind your back, your case is indefensible because you don't know what they're saying and who's saying it, so you can't defend yourself. So how much do you think being Italian-American played into that, or being a New York Italian-American? I think everything. Yeah, it's very interesting yeah. you ask that question, yeah, because, you know, I've grown up uh, in neighborhoods that were totally mixed, uh, predominantly Jewish, some black, some Puerto Rican. Uh, I was born on West 68th Street in Manhattan. I grew up in the South Bronx. So it was a tough, tough, tough area. But when I, mo uh, when I walked among those people who were not like myself, unlike myself, educated and so forth, they looked at me not as an intellectual, not as an intelligent person who could rise verbally in any manner in which he pleases, but they don't see you that way. They used to look at me and thought, oh, God, geez, yeah, don't mess with me because I got Danny with me. So I always knew from the very beginning that they thought of me as a hitter, that I wasn't one who can verbalize my way out of something. I had to fight my way out of mm -hmm. something. Well, I did that for a good portion of my life because I did live in rough neighborhoods as well, so I had to fight. But they thought of us first as physical, later as someone who might be considered intelligent. Mm -hmm. Bothered me for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that affects you in, in motion pictures, too. The, the minute you walk in, any non-Italian will address you as a person who's going to be in a, a mafia picture, right. a gangster. And I'm not saying they're all bad pictures. No. You know, some of the things I <clears throat> frowned upon, but other things I, uh, I tried to bring some majestic mm -hmm. kind of vision to a very nasty, vicious kind of a character. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The people come over to me sometimes and say to me, because there's a, there happens to be a word that I will say in the film which starts with the word F. And Bobby De Niro said to me, you are the only guy in film who can say the word F and it sounds like music. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I and I do. I, I say it in a melodic way. Yeah. People are never offended, you know. At least I don't think they are. They never told me to my face yeah. that they were. Well, most of your roles of Italian-Americans have been more positive than negative. I, I think I'm correct in yes, saying I that. Yes, I think you are. And so, in a way, you've got very little to worry about as far as the people who keep complaining about the negative portrayals, right? You're right, yeah. Anthony. That has not um, happened to me. How much pushback has there been from the community, the Italian-American community, about that? About Tremendous amount. Roles? I'm invited, yeah. for the most part, by every Italian organization that is okay. based on culture, yep. intellectual, uh, intellectuality, they approach me in a way where they see me as a positive influence, and that's been very good for me. And that, you know, at the beginning, maybe that wasn't my intent, but I, I think in the back of my mind, I always wanted to do something where a, a, a number of people, a great number of people, will be proud of the effort that I made. And I don't know that I went looking at that clearly saying, oh, this is what I want to do. It's just that that was me inside, and that was what was coming out. So the positive, every, Every political or non-political organization that was Italian have reached out for me uh, in a very kind way. So for that, I'm, I'm very pleased. And we know there are organizations that were quite famous on television and in motion pictures where many of the actors who played in these Italian gangster films were not accepted. Right. And I'm not going to mention any names. No, and know, it comes down know. to the practicality of it all. Yes. And that is, you've got to pay the rent. Right? Yes. I mean, there are two issues here, right? Number one. A, a portraying a negative character can be challenging. Yes, right? of course. And it could be satisfying Absolutely. professionally, yes. number one. Right. And number two, you got to pay the rent. you got to pay the rent, but what you is still... What is it, 5% of Screen Actors Guild work full-time? 3%. 3%. 3% of them work full-time. Yeah. So uh, the rest of them are working on very insignificant money. Yeah. It's very difficult to, uh, to raise a family on that yeah. kind of money. But you got to keep in mind that when everything tells you to say yes in this business, you sometimes have to have the strength to say no. Mm. Even when money is the object, even when money is so well needed, you cannot prostitute yourself in a way to say, no, I can't do it, this is beneath me, and this is beneath anything I want to do. Then it's then where everyone says, oh man, you're going to get a lot of money to do this. you got to be man enough to say, I know I have to pay my rent this month, but I do not want to see myself in that position for the rest of my life 
because it's on film and there it is. Mm -hmm. And you will regret that day for the yeah. rest of your life that you did a piece of crap because you did it for money needed at that moment. You so let me ask you a question, but you don't have to say what, just say yes I or no. I never even answer no, questions. No, 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 <laughs> let me ask you I am a brilliant son of a gun. Sometimes I shock myself. So. No education, <laughs> Baron. I, <laughs> so is there something, and I'm not asking you to mention the project, but is there a fairly famous project you said no to? It, I, it's very difficult for me to say this because I have nothing to prove it except yeah. that people know I've said it yeah. and the ages that I had then. Yeah. I was offended by McDonald's offering me a test commercial for $2 million to do a pizza man. And how I was dressed was a baker's hat tossing a pizza in the air. I always punch through the bag, if you know what I mean. By punching through the bag, I want to see the other side, okay? I saw myself after life, my obituary saying, the man with the white baker's hat throwing <laughs> pieces in the air, and I turned it down. Yeah. Okay? And that was a, that, because at that particular sure. time, I wasn't making heavy money. I was doing well, I was hot in the industry. Yeah. So I did as few commercials as possible. And, and that was one that I turned out was a test market. That didn't mean it was going to go through. So right. that was a lot so of money for yeah. a test. But I turned it down. Mm -hmm. And I turned other things down, which I don't recall at this mm -hmm. moment. Okay. Look, I, I, people, <clears throat> you know, some major people would ask me uh, if there were certain things that I would do. Uh, you know, a, a great thing, for instance, uh, a movie called The Pickle, which very few people saw, but I love. And they offered me $250,000. I'm not going to get to where I eventually agreed to do it. But uh, Paul Mazursky, the great director, oh, yeah. was the director. I love him. I do to this day one of the greatest directors I've ever worked with. So I went back to my agent and said, no, 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 you got to get a million dollars for the movie. Now, where was I getting a million dollars? The most I had ever made before was 250000 a movie, but I wanted a million. So I knew that Paul wanted me. So I'm sitting, sitting, and it comes back a month later, they're up to 500000 Jimmy Kohler looks at me. I said, Jimmy, I told you. It's a deal breaker. It's got to be a million. Okay, seven fifty. It's up to. It started at two fifty. You understand? Seven fifty. Now Sandy, my wife, gets wind that, that you're they offered me <laughs> seven fifty. She doesn't know that once you turn it down, it's off the table. Once you turn the money down, it goes back to zero. Okay. Now it's up to nine hundred thousand. <laughs> Now, there's some question of am I going to commit suicide or what? <laughs> they worked out a deal in arrears, in the arrears at, at the end that I would be able to have the million, and I did it. Now, that to me was only because I thought that their Sam Cohn, who was one of the great uh, agents of all time, was sitting in the Russian tea room, and he said, what the hell is a Danny Aiello? Who the hell, does he know who he's working with? He said to my agent, Jimmy Coda. And Jimmy Coda said, yes, he knows exactly who he's working with. He feels he's working with the best director in the world, and he should be paid accordingly. <laughs> and we got it. And you got it. And the picture, I love the picture. That was your first seven-figure. That was your first Yeah, seven then I got, uh, uh, yeah. for nine days, 12 days, I held up uh, Les Moonves, and I got, I got a million and a half for 12 days. That was the last Don. The last Don uh, was one of the most... Uh, I watched a series on CBS for a long period of time. I, I think it still is the most watched ever. Yeah. I liked the part when I was 89 years old, that yeah. part. The one I was a contemporary guy, I didn't particularly care for it. But I got a letter from Marlon Brando, and uh, we were standing at the Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. I had to go out and meet all the people, the distributors who were sitting in the audience sure. in May when the new series were coming out, yeah. Della Ventura was coming out. So I walk out onto the stage. Just before walking out, Johnny Planko, my agent, hands me an envelope. So I walk out with the envelope, and I open up in front of about 3,000 people, and I read it. It's from Marlon Brando. He said, you were sensational. And he must have been drinking a hell of a lot. <laughs> he said, you were absolutely, no. why didn't I use the prosthetics that you used in your character instead of the stuff I put in you my put cheeks? In and also, you have done more for civil rights than any man living. Now, I don't know what the hell I did with civil rights. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let me just mention a few titles. These are some, okay. of, my, these are some of my favorite Danny Aiello Italian-American okay. movies. And um, we'll start with my favorite. I was going to go in chronological order. My favorite, I think, is 
between 29th Street and Dinner Rush. I love doing Do the Right Thing. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Do the I Right Thing is not my favorite. But, movie. Academy but, Award nomination, but not my favorite. But movie. I think 29th Street That's and my Dinner life. Rush. Dinner Rush, I love. 29th yeah. Street is emotionally fabulous. Exactly like who yeah. I am. The father and son relationship is something I had never seen on the screen before. Yeah. Anthony LaPaglia from Anthony Australia, La yeah. which yeah. is different. Laney you know, Kazan. Laney plays, Kazan yeah. every time. Every time yeah. I'm doing the Cemetery Club, I suggested Laney. Yeah. When I did 29th Street, I wanted Laney to play my wife. Laney's a good friend and a wonderful actress. And uh, she looks a lot like my sisters. And I had a yeah. great love for her. And I yeah. still do it to this yeah. day. But uh, I love Dinner Rush and Bob Giralti, the great uh, director. It's, uh, it's a major thing. I keep begging him now, Bob, let's do another one before yeah. it's all over. We're not getting younger. Let's, he said, well, let's find one. He's full of crap. He's got all the money in the world. He should yeah. finance it and let's do it. Kind of thing. So yeah. that, and uh, I also- And it was shot at his restaurant. Gigino's here in on New York. Greenwich yep. Street. Yep. Yeah. It's yeah. about two blocks north of- of uh, Chambers. Of yep. Chambers Street yep. on Greenwich. It's, it's a wonder, wonderful, yeah. wonderful movie. Yeah. But also, I loved Once Around. Yes. Once Around, me and Jenna yes. Rollins and Richard Dreyfuss and Holly Hunter. Yes. That, for women in the audience, I would suggest that there's a movie that they want to see see that. That was a fabulous But 29th movie. Street is probably the most cult movie I've ever done, with the exception of one. Mm -hmm. Hudson Hawk. Oh, yeah. Hudson Hawk with me and Bruce Willis cost $60,000. So naturally when it came out, they said it was the biggest bomb ever. Now it's required watching. And also Jacob's Ladder. That's and Two Days in the Valley. Oh, I'm terrific in that yeah. movie. I don't want to say that. Every yes, movie I do, I want to know <laughs> I steal. You, you can't take your eyes off Danny you are. Ladder. Because you've never seen anything more obnoxious, and you'll never see it again. So you watch, you watch. You know? yeah. But uh, I've been very fortunate. Yeah. With, I don't try to upstage anyone. I'm very, I'm an eye contact actor. When I'm on the stage, I never look away from an actor. There are things that you do, do in the stage. If you get on with a new actor, there are things that you would know that a new actor may possibly not know. When you look at an actor, you're bringing attention to him. And that's mm -hmm. what you want to yeah. do if he's carrying the ball. You follow me? When you don't want to bring attention to him, if he's speaking, look this way. And they'll never look at him. They'll, kid him. they'll look at you. They'll say, look at that. He's not listening to him. They'll watch you looking away. Yeah. So there are things that you can do, but I've always been an eye contact actor because I'm getting something new. The words are the same because we've been rehearsing them and rehearsing them. Right. But you'll know they have a different meaning when you watch a person, he or her, eyes. Mm -hmm. A different meaning is attached to it. So you therefore react differently than where you might have reacted before or how you might have reacted before. You got me, Anthony? I got you. Now let's switch <laughs> gears here because where we're going now definitely I'm needs, doing acting classes definitely here need, for God's sake. Definitely so. needs eye contact. I want to get paid for acting. <laughs> you know, do I get money for this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Zen's and Productions, right? That's an Italian thing. Music. Yeah. You've been singing for years. Well, actually, I've been singing for eight years, and I've okay. done four albums. One, yeah. The original one was called I Just Wanted to Hear the Words. It was a play on words because the songs that I was hearing, I, I, I don't know if I was deaf or not, but I could never understand the words. So that's why I, I entitled it that. That hit number four on traditional jazz chart billboards. So it was right next to Tony Bennett, who was third. Uh, and Die on Crawl, I think, was, uh, was right there as well. So I was very proud of that. Then the one after that we did Live from Atlantic City. I did that because... It was at the Sands Hotel, and the last time I saw Mr. Sinatra, he was at the Sands, and then I did the show. And one unfortunate thing happened when I finished that uh, live at the Sands. They closed the place. So oh, I, my God. I thought that was a sign of my movie, uh, you know, my singing. After that, my son Denny uh, passed away of pancreatic cancer, so uh, the third album was my Christmas song for you, dedicated uh. to my son which was a, a wonderful hit. I'm talking about Critical. It didn't sell many albums because there's no company distributing records anymore. You sell them at concerts and you make iTunes money that way. And things like that. iTunes, yeah. iTunes is handling right. it for me and others. And uh, the fourth album was, of course, Bridges. Now, Bridges was the idea of me and Hassan, uh, Damon Johnson, the rapper. We thought that classic standards could be meshed with rap, clean rap, you know, because yeah. basically I'm not a rap uh, I, I'm not one who, who loves rap. You know, I, I'm I'm just not into it. But mm -hmm. Hassan showed me a kind of rap that I found very acceptable, and so therefore we got together and we put the album together. And it's we got songs like "Best Me Mocho," uh, "Lady in Red," uh, "Magic Moment," uh, uh. "Let It Be," 
Now, we got word from a friend of mine, John Tita. John Tita is the president of this publishing company in New York City. He's very close to Paul McCartney. Now, I don't know this to be a fact, except that John told me that Paul heard it with the rapper and loved it. Mm -hmm. If you get an opportunity, check on the album. Okay. It's, remember, it's called Bridges. It bridges the gap of two kinds of music. Of music. First time it's ever been done, classic standard with rap. Now, Steven Tyler, it's terrific. Yeah. He did something, yeah. but it wasn't classic. He did something with rap artists, yeah. but not like what we did. There are two movies in post-production, right? One's animation. Uh, yes. Where you were Henry and me. Henry I play. I play the young boy who's, who's uh, devastated with cancer. Yeah. And wants to be a Yankee, and uh, I play his doctor. Yeah. And there's uh, Richard uh, Gear, mm -hmm. is playing uh, Lou Gehrig, and yeah. there are others in it as yeah. well. And uh, the other one is a movie called Reach Me, which is a terrific movie. There are numerous stars in it. Now, John Hirschfeld, who directed uh, Two Days in the Valley, is the director. Right. Now, John first worked with me on The Preppy Murder. Do you remember that? Yeah. That was the Robert the Chambers, Chambers case, case when right. the, the Levin, the, the, the young the lady, girl in the park. Jennifer Levin the young woman was strangled. In the park. I played detective, uh, the detective yeah. who settled the case, and John was the director. Then I did another television movie with him called Daddy. Then I've, I did Two Days in the Valley, and now this. This I love because he offered me the role. I didn't want to go to California to do it, so I said, John, I can't. So he's telling me, he said, Kelsey Graham is in it. Uh, Akira Sedgwick is in it. Uh, uh, Kevin Conley from Entourage is in it. Uh, Tom Sizemore is in it. Sylvester Stallone's in it. So we have about 12 stars. But I said, John, I don't want to do it. You offered me a role. I've done it already. And they're all the same sizes. That's what John does. It's mm -hmm. an ensemble thing. Right. So I look at the script. He said, well, is there anything else? I said, well, John, I'll tell you the truth. I thought he'd say no, and this would give me a reason not to do it. I said, I'll play the priest. He said, it's an underwritten part. I said, let me write it. Let me put my input into it. So I made the priest to be a man who was in love many years earlier, and he was jilted by the girl, and for that he went into seminary. So he became a priest, or attempted to become a priest for the wrong reasons. Now, once he was in seminary, he fell in love with God and decided to go on to be a priest. However, his one burden is that he's a major alcoholic and unable to control it. Mm. Now, one of the actors by the name of Tommy John, who's one of the other stars, is a cop who's killed a lot of people, and he keeps coming into my booth asking for confession. <laughs> and one day I walk over to him outside the booth without my collar and I said, find a new church. I said, I will not accept your confessions anymore. He said, Jesus wouldn't do that. I said, I'm not Jesus. I'm just a reasonable facsimile with a problem. <laughs> Did you ever hear a line like that in a movie? You'll know that I wrote that line. But uh, the movie is supposed to be great. They had little yeah. financial problems, but mm. they're coming through it and uh, it should be out in about five, in February, I think. Oh, February Movies 2014. Movies will be terrific. Good, good. Terrific. Kira Sedgwick and I have most of our scenes She's together. fabulous. Actress. She's the girl from yeah. The Closer. Right, exactly. She became my great friend. Could I say something I did in the set? You can say something. It's very brief. Tommy Jean, a handsome kid, looks like, uh, he looks like Steve McQueen, okay? He's mumbling. He's doing a scene with me and he's mumbling. And I look over at John, who's the director, John, and he's coming telling me, so I said, John, do me a favor. Would you tell this guy to stop mumbling? What does he think, he's Marlon Brando? <laughs> he heard me. I'm talking right in front of him. Kira Sedgwick walks over and says to me, I love you. <laughs> I love you. He's mumbling like Brando. She repeated it, which was more insulting. But of course, I love Tommy Jane, yeah. and he's terrific. It was just that his character was a mumbler. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. have to do that with every character, but he was with that. And uh, I'm anxious to see the movie. We're anxious to see it as well. We feel privileged to have you with us. Would you tell the you. people dannyaiello.com so they can look at my music? Of course. And some of these days, of you're going to miss me, baby. Some of these days, you're going to feel so lonely. You're going to miss my hugging. You're going to miss my kissing. You're going to miss me, baby. When you're long gone away, well, I hope you feel lonely and you want me only cause you know, pretty baby, you've always had your way. Say, baby, when you leave me, you know you're gonna grieve me. You're gonna miss your tall, thin 
Danny, some of these days. Love you. Thank you. <laughs> it's all right, Anthony. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this special episode of Italics. Tune in next week for two episodes of Italics, our regular program airing October 30th, dedicated to Sandy one year later, and our fourth and final 2013 Italian Heritage and Culture Month special airing October 31st. On our next Italian Heritage and Culture Month special, we're joined right here in our studios by Frank G. Fusato, President, and Louis Tallarini, Chairman of the Columbus Citizens Foundation, as well as Vincenzo Marra, President and Founder of Ilica, the Italian Language Intercultural Alliance, and his daughter Ilaria Marra Rossiglioni, Ilica Special Events Coordinator. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata. Sing, 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 sing. Everybody start to sing. La di da, ho ho ho. Now you're singing with a swing. Singing with a swing. Ah, but I do, I do, but 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 I do, but